Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage. Today's garbage is Howard Lovecraft and Undersea Kingdom, a children's animated movie that I found at Dollar Tree. It's loosely based on the works of American horror writer H.P. Lovecraft, but it's actually adapted from a graphic novel based on his work nobody has heard of. And it's the second film of a trilogy. Yeah, somebody made three of these. And this is the only one I've seen, so I ain't gonna be comparing it to the other ones. Now, isn't this just the worst idea ever? I mean, this isn't like Tolkien, whose works feature wars and sword fighting, but also feature goofy little hobbits and dwarves. And you can tone down the violence and make a kid-friendly movie without compromising respect for the source material, because it's ultimately a story about, you know, adventure and the power of friendship and that sort of thing. But Lovecraft is heavy subject matter that most adults don't even understand. His most well-known writings are all horror stories. And most of them feature horrifying creatures, but not, they're, they're not about the creatures. They're about abstract fears, like the idea that all human religions are wrong, that the universe is indifferent to our suffering, and that we, that we could be wiped out in an instant with no hope of resisting our destruction, that there exist cosmic horrors which we couldn't possibly understand, and that our existence is utterly pointless. These are heady themes that can't really be explored in a movie aimed at children, who can't even spell Cthulhu. So if you want to make a Lovecraft kids movie, you're going to have to leave these ideas out. So what happens when you strip out the Lovecraftian themes from a Lovecraft story? You're just left with tentacle monsters and fishmen. But, but to make things worse, the tentacle monsters and fishmen can't be scary in a kid's movie, so you have to s soften their image and make them look like something you'd see in a commercial for athlete's foot cream. You simply can't make a kid's movie based on the works of Lovecraft without co completely missing the point of his works. And those necessary compromises render any attempt to do so in inherently disrespectful to the source material. This is not an adaptation of Lovecraft's work. It's just a low-budget kids movie with the names taken from Lovecraft's Wikipedia article. And understand that when I say this movie is disrespectful, it's not because I'm some angry fanboy who's mad about what they did to Cthulhu. My issue is, if, you, if you're not going to respect the source material, then what's the point? Other than to capitalize on a well-known property with a pre-established fanbase which you don't even have to license because it's in the public domain. It's really one of the most cynical things I've ever seen. You take the writings of a famous dead author and slap together a cheap movie loosely based on it, pay a handful of big-name actors the SAG minimum to record their lines from their bedrooms just so you can say they're in it, and aim it at an audience too young to even notice how poorly animated it is. Oh, hold on. Oh, hey Cthulhu. Hey, possum. You need to borrow some more money? Actually, I was just passing by and wondering if you are coming to my clarinet recital tonight. Oh, I can't. I have to talk about this stupid movie. What movie? Howard Lovecraft in the Undersea Kingdom. Oh, I hate that movie. It makes me look like a loser. Yeah, well, I have to get back to work. Okay, well, I guess I'll let you go. Oh, actually, can I borrow five dollars for gas? I'm sure I won't hear from him again for the rest of the video. And maybe I could do this review without any more interruptions. The movie starts with the camera zooming in on a house. We see a Tim Burton reject sleeping in his clothes like some kind of weirdo. It turns out this is our protagonist, Howard Lovecraft. Isn't he cute? Almost makes you forget he grows up to become a screaming racist. Howard wakes up and complains about his weird dreams, and then he hears a voice coming from a nearby book. Then he gets up to look out the window and sees fish. I ain't talking about the kind that makes crappy music for stoners. Apparently the house is underwater now. Then a tentacle reaches in and grabs Howard, and we're introduced to what looks like a Clay Fighter character. But this is Howard's sidekick, who we met in the previous movie. He looks like Cthulhu, but he isn't. His name is Tutu Hamang, but Howard calls him Spot. Spot tries to warn Howard about King Abdul, the villain from the previous movie, forming an alliance with somebody worse. He also tells him not to let any anybody have the book, especially his father. Then Howard wakes up and his mom tells him it's time to go to school, but she says it in the most sinister way possible. And don't keep mother waiting. We then cut to another dimension or something where a CGI castle straight out of a 3DO game is being approached by four hideous fish children who are voiced by the director's kids. No, really. I can't wait to see King Tutu Hamong. He doesn't want us to call him King. You know that, Innes. But Gotha, he is a king. 
These characters talk about how the castle used to be covered in ice when some bad guy was king. So we know what happens in the previous movie since nobody on God's green earth has seen it. It's hard to believe that Algid was once King Abdul. Don't say his name. Howard beat him up. Algid was a girl. Yeah, that's not clunky at all. The fish kids walk through the town, which consists of the same building copy-pasted all over, and make their way to the castle where some won't let them in. They tell him they're friends of King Spot, so he knocks on the door to announce them, but Spot tells him to f**k off. But then one of the kids ca calls out to him, and he bursts through the door. Then the fish kids follow Spot to his throne room, and he explains he has to go into his astral state, so he can communicate with Howard across dimensions. Back at Howard's house, Howard sees the book glow and fly under the bed. Then his mom comes to talk, comes to take him to school, which is apparently off the edge of a cliff because the animators couldn't be bothered to make the house on a street. Look at this edit. It's just a bit of fog off the bay. Don't you mean the river? Of course. It's impolite to correct your elders, Howard. I'm sorry, Mother. There was no transition from them walking through the yard and walking down the street. So Howard and his mom walk down the barren street in their town, which is completely empty because background characters are hard to animate, and they walk past the school. Howard's mom explains they have to do something first, and end up going to the asylum. And I ain't talking about the company that makes such classic rip-off movies as Snakes on a Train and Transmorphers. Then Howard's mom's eyes glow, which in movies means she's under mind control. Meanwhile, Spot goes from dimension to dimension looking for Howard, then nothing happens. What the f***? My phone just buzzed. Uh, probably a stupid weather alert. A rip current statement. <laughs> We're gonna give you a, a rip current statement on uh, a warning about the rip current on your phone, even though you don't live anywhere near the water. <laughs> let, let, let us interrupt your day with this warning that isn't relevant to you in any meaningful way. <laughs> no, where the f am I? Meanwhile, Spot goes from dimension to dimension looking for Howard, then nothing happens. Back on Earth, Howard's mom drags him to the asylum and hypnotizes the guard who proceeds to throw him into the cell, where we meet our main villain, Abdul Alzared, who in Lovecraft's mythology is the author of the Necronomicon. In this movie, he's some kind of shape-shifting wizard with a skull mask. Abdul tries to get Howard to do something, but then Spot comes out of a portal and blinds Abdul long enough for Howard to escape through the unlocked door. Howard and Spot run down the hallway and are about to escape through a portal when Abdul shows he has Howard's parents captive, but Spot forces Howard through the... and they escape. Then Abdul talks to the guy he's working for and explains he casts a transformation spell on Howard that will turn him into a fish person, which for some reason means Abdul will be able to control him. This is Nyarlathotep, by the way, a recurring shape-shifting entity from Lovecraft's work, and one of the few who's actively malevolent rather than just indifferent to human suffering. Depicted in this movie as a skinny guy in a hood. He's voiced by washed-up actor Doug Bradley, the guy who played Pinhead in the Hellraiser movies, because he didn't have anything better to do. My father will not tolerate your failure a second time. If you're wondering why these guys are wearing masks, it's so the animators don't have to animate their faces. As Howard and Spot zip through the space between dimensions, Spot suddenly disappears and Howard gets dumped in a library somewhere. Spot finds himself back in his own castle, trapped in a crystal ball by Abdul, who somehow managed to get there in the five seconds since Howard and Spot escaped through a portal. Abdul explains his evil plan. I will awaken you, dreamer. You will be the destroyer. Howard wanders around the library for a while until he runs into the chief librarian of Miskatonic University, Dr. Henry Armitage, voiced by Mark Hamill. Yes, that Mark Hamill. And do you mind if I ask you, why are you here, on university grounds, unattended? Howard tells Dr. Armitage about Spot, and it turns out he knows him. Then Dr. Armitage explains that Abdul needs Howard's father's three journals so he can combine them together to form the Necronomicon and use it to turn Spot into Cthulhu, who would then proceed to destroy the world. Uh, none of that is how it works in, the, in Lovecraft's writings, but th there you go. But one of the three journals is at Howard's house, which is protected by magic runes so Abdul can't get to it. And another is at the asylum where Howard's father is a patient. Dr. Armitage tells Howard to bring him the three journals so he can make the Necronomicon, so he can use it to stop Abdul and reverse the transformation spell. It's at this point that Howard realizes he's been cursed and asks Dr. Armitage if he knows any spells that can undo it. But he says he can and they need the Necronomicon. Back at Spot's castle, Abdul and Nyarlathotep 
explain that if Howard doesn't bring them the journals, they'll, they'll kill his mother. Howard and Dr. Armitage go, through, go to the asylum to find his father's second journal, but they stop when they hear something. Take a leave. Take a leave. Is that the Chagoth? Abdul uses them as his guards. Hearing them is actually a good sign. Okay, so I guess we're about to see the Shogoths. So Howard and Dr. Armitage walk through the asylum until they hear a scream. Then run to an open cell where they find Howard's father, Winfield, being pestered by, uh... What are those? Did this just turn into a commercial for cold medicine? Psst, hey, Possum, those are actually the Shogoths. Those are the Shogoths? They don't look anything like what Lovecraft described. This is how Lovecraft described the Shogoths in At the Mountains of Madness. It was a terrible, indescribable thing, vaster than any subway train. A shapeless congoggeries of protoplasmic bubbles, faintly self-luminous, and with myriads of temporary eyes forming and unforming as pustules of greenish light all over the tunnel-filling front that bore down upon us, crushing the frantic penguins and slithering over the glistening floor that it and its kind had swept so evilly free of all litter. Does this thing look anything like that? No! It looks like a Pokemon with syphilis. It looks like Jim Henson's kidney stone. It looks like a pork chop somebody dropped behind the couch and left there for nine years. This isn't a Shogoth. A uh, Shogoth is supposed to be horrifying, like when Hillary Clinton unhinges her jaw to swallow an egg. This is a goofy Muppet that somebody slapped together in Blender in five minutes. Uh, why are they voiced by Ron Perlman? Tekalili. Tekalili. And this audio gets reused over and over. Why'd they hire Ron Perlman to say one word? How much did- how much did he charge for that? That money could have been spent improving the animation, or donated to some poor kid with Nogger Syndrome. Holy hell, we're only a quarter of the way through the movie. Hello? Hey, Possum. The conductor got arrested for public misuse of a pogo stick. The recital's cancelled. Really? What's all that noise? I'm at a party. Uh, yeah? Who's there? Hmm, let me see. Blandest. Charles J. Harris. Frumious Jabberwock. Jaron Marles. John Wellington. Keith Paul. King DDD1273. Lex Reardon. McSquizzy. Michael Lowe. Paco. Ricky Baruga. Toastface and Victor Alexandrovich Gontar. Hey, wait a minute. Why are my patrons at a party I wasn't invited to? Probably because you're a loser. <laughs> you son of a bitch. Later, rodent boy. Possums aren't rodents. Hello? That cephalopod mother I'll fix his wagon. So Howard pulls out a silver medallion thing, which I guess he got in the first movie, and uses it to explode the Shogoths. And then he and Dr. Armitage rescue Howard's father, and go to the asylum library, where Howard's father finds the second journal. Then they run outside and into the woods, and I guess they ran for several hours, because the next thing we know it's daytime. Howard and Dr. Armitage tell Winfield that Abdul has put a transformation spell on Howard, and Howard asks his father where his mother is. Winfield simply says Abdul took her away, so Howard decides they should use the spells in the journal to open a portal to find Spot, but Dr. Armitage says it would take too long for Howard to learn the spells. The spells I've accumulated have come with years and years worth of studying. They can't simply be taught like that. But then Howard asks nicely. Cut to the basement of a castle or something where a bunch of Shogoths are headbutting a wall. One of them tells Abdul it ain't working, so he goes up to the wall and tries to cast a spell. But when he tries to force the Shagoth to go through it, it explodes. Then Nirava walks up and tells Abdul that there's some kind of spell on the wall, which they're trying to get through because the third journal is on the other side. But they can't because only a member of the Lovecraft family can get through. Nirlathotep calls Abdul an asshole. Then Abdul tells how its mind-controlled mother to walk through the wall. But it doesn't work because they need a blood relative of Winfield Lovecraft. You can probably guess where this is going. So Howard, Dr. Armitage, and Woodfield are still in the woods, and Dr. Armitage teaches Howard about magic. The movie goes into a lot of detail about how magic is like water in the sense that it can be redirected and frozen and sh**, but it really doesn't matter. The important thing is, is we get a training montage in which Howard learns how to levitate things and make force fields, and thus, through the power of contrived writing, Howard learns in five minutes what would normally take years. 
the spells I've accumulated have come with years and years worth of studying. Who would have thought that Mark Hamill would play a mentor character who gets showed up by his Mary Sue apprentice twice in the same year? Go away! So right after Howard learns of all these new spells, the Shogoths attack, so he gets a chance to show off. After defeating the Shogoths, Dr. Armitage sends the journal back to Miskatonic, where it will be safe. Then they go through a portal to Spot's castle, where they get attacked by more Shogoths. There are too many to fight this time, so Howard uses the medallion thing again, but then even more Shogoths show up and he loses it. Then they get captured. Abdul does a villain monologue, then threatens to kill Howard's family to get him to retrieve the third journal. But just before he goes through the portal, Howard uses his newfound magical abilities to free Winfield and Dr. Armitage, and then they escape with Spot through another portal, but not before Dr. Armitage gets shot by Abdul's magic thing. The gang escapes back to the woods, but Dr. Armitage is injured, so he has to sit out the rest of the movie. He frees Spot from the crystal ball, then goes through the portal back to Miskatonic. Then Howard, Winfield, and Spot start walking to a place called the Shun Circle. On the way, Winfield explains how he wrote the journals based on things he saw in his dreams. Then we get a flashback to when he met some guy named Dr. West, voiced by Triple Crown winning actor Christopher Plummer for some reason. Absolutely extraordinary, these portals of yours. Together, they open a portal and Winfield went through to some place called Yagoth, where they found the titular Undersea Kingdom. But before he could reach it, he encountered a giant fish monster named Dagon another creature from Lovecraft stories, the sight of which drove him insane. Dagon stole Winfield's journal, which he brought with him underwater for some reason, so that means the journal is presumably somewhere in the Undersea Kingdom now. Then Howard and the gang arrive at the Shun Circle. It is the key to travel in the megacosm! While Winfield talks to himself, trying to remember whatever it is he's supposed to do there, Spot explains what a megacosm is to Howard, so it'll be explained to the audience, because they think we're too stupid to figure out what a megacosm is based on the sound of the word alone. The megacosm. There are numerous universes, Master Howard. The nexus between each universe- Yeah, we get it. Winfield digs up a trap door to a secret bunker where he kept his old diving suit. Then he puts it on so you can go to the Undersea Kingdom and find the last journal, and tells Howard he can't come with him because it's too dangerous. But then Spot reminds Winfield that Howard knows magic, which makes him pretty much the only one of them qualified to go there. So Winfield opens the portal and they travel to Yagoth. And as they approach the water, Dagon appears and he grabs Howard. But it turns out Howard can breathe underwater since he's turning into a fish. And it turns out Dagon just wanted to talk to him. Did he know Howard could breathe underwater? Dagon tells Howard about how his father's journals contain the spells that can destroy every universe in the megacosm. And so, the Lovecraft family is now responsible for keeping them from falling into the wrong hands. But Dagon judged that Winfield was too crazy or stupid to protect the journal himself. So he took it from him and hid it in the Undersea Kingdom behind the wall we saw Abdul trying to get through earlier, and put a spell on it so only Winfield or one of his blood relatives could get through it. Dagon also explains that he, Nyarlathotep, and Spot were all created by Azathoth, another Lovecraft thing. And this for some reason makes him unable to go against Nyarlathotep and Abdul, so he can't kick them out of the Undersea Kingdom. But what he can do is teleport Howard and the gang to the Kingdom, so that's what he does. So Howard, Winfield, and Spot arrive in the Undersea Kingdom, and the disembodied voice of Nyarlathotep tells Howard to close his eyes so he can show him a vision of Azathoth. Then Abdul shows up with Howard's mom, and Howard and Spot go through the wall. So Howard and Spot have to pass three trials. The first of which is a Resident Evil puzzle, the second an Indiana Jones trap, and the third a Zelda puzzle. They pass all three with little difficulty, then pass through a room full of fish people who are just kind of standing around in this room like they have nothing better to do. Howard retrieves the journal, then they make their way back to give it to Abdul. So Howard starts reciting the spell that m makes Spot turn into Cthulhu, but it turns out he can't finish the spell because only a Lovecraft can use the journal. Oh! Okay. So all this time they were trying to stop something that never could have happened anyway. Great! So Nyarl shows up and lights Abdul on fire. Lights him on fire. <laughs> the kids' movie lights a guy on fire. <laughs>
Uh, so your last attempt shows if it lights up dual on fire, then Howard and the gang escape through a portal back to the library. But it turns out Howard's mom is dying, so Howard goes through another portal to retrieve the other journal from his house. So Dr. Armitage binds all three journals together into the Necronomicon. Howard uses it to undo the spell on his mother and himself, turning them both back to normal. Howard tells Dr. Armitage he will take the Necronomicon back to his house where magic runes will keep it safe. Dr. Armitage tells him never to look at it. Then Spot goes through a portal back to his kingdom so he can f**k around with the fish kids that we all forgot about by now. Then Howard goes home. Then Howard hears a knock at the door, so he goes to answer it and sees an adult version of himself. But then the movie ends before he gets a chance to yell racial slurs at anyone. So that's Howard Lovecraft and the Undersea Kingdom, a movie that exists for some reason. Now if you'll excuse me, there's a great old one I need to get revenge on. This song is actually kind of long, isn't it? Hey, Cthulhu! What? Possum? What are you doing here? I've come to get revenge on you for calling me a rodent. Oh no! What are you gonna do? This! F*** you! Thank you for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, support me on Patreon, submit your fan art to me on Facebook, and follow me on Twitter. All the links are in the description.